opens, the world closes. <laughs> Geopolitically, it was much easier in the sixth century to do this tour than it is right now. Um, but at any rate, I, I thought we would, since I, I take groups to monasteries everywhere we go, any place we can find a monastery, I'm a history, historian of religion. And so we uh, have wandered the world and seen lots and lots of monasteries. And I thought what I ought to do today is to simply uh, discuss why there are so many of them, you know, that we've, and, and then where did they come from? What were they for? So that we can get an introduction to this very deep cultural phenomena of Christian monasticism. It's um, hard for modern people, I think, to understand sometimes what Christian monasticism was all about, but we're gonna try and explain that today. So let's start with this, this problem. Uh, where did it come from? You have to understand that Christianity, of course, begins, uh, this is a trick question, right? In what year AD does Christianity begin? Uh, not zero, not a, <laughs> with the birth of Jesus, but actually the crucifixion somewhere around the year 30 to 33. By the third century, of course, it was maybe 20% of the empire had become Christian, and, but there, there was a, it was a period of persecution. The persecution ends with the Edict of Toleration in 313, and that created a real problem for the, the believers because they had been participating in a religion that required you to die for the faith. You had to be ready to be killed. You know, the red martyrdom, and you all know the stories about Christians and lions and things like that that Eusebius of Caesarea and others like to tell. But the lions weren't getting any Christians any longer. So how could you prove your dedication to Christ? And so you go from having the red martyrdom of real blood to the idea of a white martyrdom, which is there's no blood involved, but nonetheless, it is a sacrifice of yourself. It's the voluntary withdrawal from the world. And instead of having someone else kill you for the faith, you died to society for the faith. Um, it's, it's, like I say, it's not necessarily a concept that most of us quite understand. Um, but by the end of the lecture, maybe you at least have a sympathetic feeling for them. Um, so let's start with the father of monks. St. Anthony of Egypt, or St. Anthony the Great. Uh, and you can spell that with an H in it or without an H, depends on who you're, you just don't want to confuse him with St. Anthony of Padua. But St. Anthony of Egypt is considered to be the, the father of all the ascetics because he models this retreat into the desert and this life of solitude. Uh, we know a lot about him because Athanasius wrote a life of him. And that life spreads everywhere. Everyone reads about St. Anthony, and lots and lots of people try and copy it. But his model of withdrawal from society, his white martyrdom, was to retreat uh, into a place of privacy, of total privacy. And he cuts himself off from society. The problem is that people really are attracted to this idea. Third century or fourth century is a terrible time to be in the Roman Empire. Everything is falling apart. Uh, we have plague, that sounds familiar. Uh, we have political collapse, we have invasions. And so people are not happy in Roman society. And so there's this withdrawal going on. And apparently what Anthony was doing was very attractive to lots of people. And he's modeling a Christian life that, that just cuts off from society. He's, he starts out as sort of a village hermit, uh, but keeps retreating further and further into the desert. Uh, to get away from people. So he ends up as, as a monk or as a, as a hermit. Remember, hermits are people who live by themselves, uh, often in a cave, but they became so popular, you can see that the lower left, there's a picture of the, these are hermits' caves in Syria. It's like a high rise, you know, there are so many hermits moving in. On the right, there's a picture of a hermit's uh, hermitage in, in Egypt, but you retreat into the wilderness. You, get a, you want to be alone. You want to be deeply isolated so that you can wrestle with the demons in yourself uh, and make progress in your spiritual life. You get closer to God. He ends up on the Red Sea. This is down there on the lower left. You can see there's a little blob of civilization. That's where he's buried. That's where he, the monastery that he founded in, in eastern Egypt on the Red Sea, near the Red Sea coast. But you can see it's a place of total isolation and, and I think even now many of us would say desolation. 
So it's not a pleasant place to live, but he wasn't looking for pleasant. What he was looking for is this a chance to be alone. Uh, kind of like a movie star, right? But he becomes the father of all monks. And, and because his model was as, as a hermit in the desert, many, many people will, will repeat this experiment of trying to live, live alone. As you can see, if you're on the left, there's St. Anthony. On my left, he's the guy in, in the black cap with the cross on it. Um, on the right is a, a famous monk uh, whose name I can never pronounce, Gebre Mefus Kidu, or Kider, depending on, on how people transliterate it. Uh, he's a late, well, a 14th century monk, but he's a very popular monk in Ethiopia. But he sort of is the, one of the models for living this life of isolation. He keeps going deeper and deeper into the desert. and he, he wrestles with the wild beasts who should eat him, but eventually he is so holy um, and so pure that he gets 60 lions and 60 leopards who follow him around at all times. Uh, a raven either tries to pluck out his eyes and, and that Satan and is defeated, or he allows the raven to drink from his eyes, which is an act of Christian char charity, or as you can see in this particular um, image that, that the raven provides him with the, the Eucharist. Uh, he doesn't wear any clothes, so he, his clothing is actually his own hair. So this, this is, Anthony is creating a model for a lifestyle of extreme deprivation uh, and, and physical suffering. Very popular. Many, many people like it. A few people try and live it. Uh, in fact, enough people try and live it that communities start to form. Um, and so if, if you, well, we'll go to the map of Egypt and then pop back here again. So here in the, in the north, Nitria, Kelia, Sketis, uh, you can see this is a concentration of communities. Here's where Anthony was. He starts on the Nile, he ends up on the Red Sea. And so these communities uh, that begin to form, form around gurus, abbas, fathers. They form around these, these holy men. And, and the holy men are living in caves and holes in the rocks. Um, and sometimes in gardens, you know, the, all sorts of deprivation, but people come and they want spiritual advice. They want to follow this holiness. And so you have great leaders like Anthony Arsenius, John the Dwarf. We can go on and on with the, the names of these people because we know a lot about them because people collected their sayings. Uh, and so these communities began to form. Somebody, uh, at the time said that St. Anthony uh, basically he had turned the desert into a city. So many people wanted to live around St. Anthony, all of them finding their own little place, but all of them living this life of desolation and deprivation, but seeking his leadership, seeking his advice. So <coughs> the desert became a city. You can see here this, in this photograph, this is an archeological uh, look at what happened. This is this is Kelia, this the cells uh, in northern Egypt, and you can see just how many of them are, there are. But these people were living in individual cells with, with the common area of worship, not necessarily common leadership, but a common area of worship. Each each of these communities is sort of walled into itself, but they're also very much in, in close relationship to one another. So thousands of people will take to the desert to become monks in the model of St. Anthony. So that's, that's the beginning of the movement. But in Southern Egypt, St. Pacomius uh, has a different idea. He starts out like everybody, he has a cave too. Um, but he realizes that all these monks living together need organization. And so, you know, the 320, so Anthony, he and, and Anthony, Anthony is older than he is. Anthony lives, by the way, to be 101, so apparently this life is good for you. Um, but Baconius begins to organize his monks into communities that actually have government, because he realizes that when you're battling with temptation, it's easier if the structure takes away the temptation than if you have to remove all the temptation yourself. So his monks can each have a cell, but they are part of a community, they worship together, they dine together, but otherwise they live apart. So mutual support is what he's trying to create. And so he writes this thing called the Asketon. The Asketon, you know, the word ascetic, the Asketon is a set of rules for the monks 
that he creates to keep them all living on the, the very straight and the very narrow. So let's see, if you're going to live under his rules, what do you do? Let no one sleep outside of his couch. So if you've got your cave, your cell, you've got to stay in your cell at night. Let no one go outside of the cloister without the knowledge of the prior. So you've got a community that's got some sort of wall around it, and you have to get permission to go outside. Let no one anoint or wash his whole body in his sickness. That one seems odd to us, but you can imagine that, that washing yourself is quite a sinful activity. The body should not be pampered. And then what do you have? You have possessions. You have no possessions. If anyone accumulates anything, you have to turn it over to the community. And you have to do penance. His prostrations are to be increased 200 times. Well, prostrations mean that, um, well, uh, maybe some of you on the call have been with me uh, to the monastery outside of Marden in, in Turkey, where we see the, the monks, fourth century monastery, the monks are still praying with prostration. It's the form of prayer used by Muslims, but it was learned by the Muslims from the Christians that eventually became Muslims. And so prostrations down on the knees, head to the floor. So you 200 prostrations extra. I'm not quite sure how many prostrations you were supposed to have otherwise. But you can see that he's, he's got rules and he's got control. And the things that cause you temptation are removed by the system. So Pacomius's system is actually better than Anthony's system uh, that way. We know a lot about these guys because their, their followers would collect their sayings. And there are lots of, of, of these collections. And they, they're the, the Apoth, the Gamata, or the sayings of the Desert Fathers. And, and so these have been edited by a number of scholars. They're online. They're free from the Cistercians. Um, but you can see how life was conceived of by these people who were going off to live an ascetic lifestyle. Um, Isaiah of Scetus, silence gives birth to ascetic discipline. Ascetic discipline gives birth to weeping. Weeping gives rise to the fear of God. Godly fear begets humility. Humility begets foresight. Foresight begets love. Love renders the soul undiseased and free from the passions. And then and only then does a person know that he is far from God. So you can see this, this discipline of denial. At first you admit your sin and, and your total inability to control. And then you become, you need God. You become afraid of God. But godly fear begets humility. You can't do anything without God. And then you understand that God loves you. And because God loves you, it takes away the sin from your soul, and you are freed from passion. And then you know how desperately you, you are being helped by God and how far you are from God. So it's a process. It's a journey that takes you closer and closer to God. So th this, this journey has a particular purpose. Um, when... God created everything in Gen the book of Genesis. You know, the, the seven days are done. <clears throat> he creates the Garden of Eden. He puts Adam and Eve in, in the garden. And it's just Adam and Eve. And they do not know that they are naked. And he said, you can do anything you want here, but don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And, of course, they do. And God catches them at it, and he curses them. And the curse that God lays on Adam and Eve then is inherited by all of humanity. He says, you're going to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. You have to work. You're going to have children in pain in childbirth, and then you're all going to die. Those are the three curses of the Garden of Eden. So if you think about what he's saying, family and society are the curse that God has laid upon humanity because they are impure. So if you want to get pure, go back to the purity of the Garden of Eden. To be like Adam and Eve in the beginning, you have to avoid family and society. So this is a lifestyle that is totally antisocial in that sense. Of, it's not good to be with other people. It's not good to have family. Of course, all, all things that produce family, like sex, are bad. So asceticism is to get you back to that pure relationship with God that Adam and Eve had. 
One of my favorites of, of these fathers is Abba Arsenius. And Arsenius's life kind of sums up a lot of the story of these people. Um, he'd been in a very powerful position in Jerusalem. And so they, somebody says they go, the formula is speak to me a word, Father, that I might live, that I might have eternal life. So he tells these stories. While living in the palace, Abba Arsenius prayed to God in these words, Lord, lead me in the way of salvation. And a voice came saying to him, Arsenius, flee from men and you will be saved. Having withdrawn to the solitary life, he made the same prayer again. And he heard a voice saying to him, Arsenius, flee, be silent, pray always, for these are the sources of sinfulness. Remove yourself from society. Spend all of your time in prayer, as it says in the Bible, pray without ceasing, and you will achieve sinlessness. That's the whole idea, sinlessness, withdrawal, contemplation of God. So, live in humility, total humility. You work, I mean, they make mats, they make ropes, but you have nothing, you own nothing. Your life is focused on God. It's a solitude, silence, contemplative, quiet, constant meditative prayer. Uh, some of you may know the, 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 the great prayer that is used in Pacomius' monasteries. It's called the Jesus Prayer. And if you even know anyone in the Orthodox communities, uh, this is still very popular. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's very short. The trick is... You should say it endlessly. I always tell my students, I want you to go home tonight and close your eyes and say this 10,000 times while you rock back and forth. Um, because this is a way of praying constantly, of constantly being in communion with God while paying no attention whatsoever to the world that is around you. Pay no attention to your body. Pay no attention to the, the noises in your mind. Keep concentrated on God. Hesychastic prayer, solitude, silence, quiet, and then you can commune with God. But communion with God, of course, requires you to give up yourself. This, this is the, you give up your ego. Nabot Macarius, who's the contemporary of Arsenius, said, if slander has become to you the same as praise, poverty is riches, deprivation is abundance, you will not die, meaning you, you won't, you know, your soul won't die. Indeed, it is impossible for anyone who firmly believes, who labors with devotion, to fall into the impurity of the passions and to be led astray by the demons. Give up everything, give up your ego, and you will achieve true humility, and that will lead you to give up your passions. But the demons are very important. Demons are everywhere. This is a very literal, I mean, we, we know about demons and we talk about demons, you know, we all have our demons, but these demons you can see. Uh, the, 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 the Desert Fathers were quite used to wrestling with real live ones. One of the most important descriptions of battling with demons is actually St. Anthony's own description. Um, he preaches a famous sermon to, to the monks uh, and it says that he preaches in the Coptic language, and, and he preaches the sermon, and, it, and he describes the battle with the demons. You can see in this modern painting the, the, the kinds of demons there are, uh, wild animals, serpents, dragons, all sorts of things. This is his, his part of his sermon. The demons, if they see all Christians and monks, especially cheerfully and advancing, first make an attack by temptation and place hindrance to hamper our way. Evil thoughts. Um, but if we use prayer, fasting, and faith, we can defeat their attack. But even then, the demons don't quit. They use subtlety. For then they're going, they cannot deceive the heart openly. Openly, they're going to use uh, shaping, or they will shape displays that strike fear, changing shapes, taking different forms, women, wild beasts, creeping things, gigantic bodies, troops of soldiers, so you can see he's, it's this world, this, this chattering monster is everywhere. Uh, another, another Abba um, talks, he says, he gives a piece of advice, he says, look to the east. And, and he sees all the demons flying in attacks. And look to the west, and you see the angels flying to defeat the demons. And 
the ascetic in his cell is caught. The demons are all around him. They're screaming, they're hollering, they're trying to strangle him, to bite him, to seduce him. But always, if he keeps faith, makes the sign of the cross, keeps the faith, he can defeat the demons. If those demons dwell within you, and they come to you, and you're locked in the cell, they come to you anyway, and they try and defeat you. Well, this lifestyle that the Egyptian fathers were living spreads across the, the Christian world. When I say the Christian world at this point, we're talking pretty much uh, Asia Minor. <clears throat> and so if you're a devout Christian, you often go to Egypt. You learn how to do this, and then you bring it home with you. And one of the people who brought it home is Basil of Caesarea, or Caesarea, however you want to pronounce it. Um, you see, he's 330 to 379, and his sister Macrina, who was born at about the same time, we don't know really when she's born, so this is, but anyway, they're, they're near the same age. Um, and the two of them both experiment with, with Egyptian monasticism as practiced in Cappadocia and Turkey. So they, they bring the, the Egyptian ideas uh, to Turkey, and they set up proto-monasteries there. Uh, Macarena gets a lot of credit because she creates a community of virgins, um, which her mother joins. By the way, this is a great family. There are five saints in the family. Uh, the, but her, the family, she creates this community of women who live holy lives. And she also works miracles. She's especially good at curing the blind. But her brother, Basil, is the bishop. And so he supports this and he encourages other people to live this way. Uh, and so their model is Pacomian, but uh, in more community. So if the Pacomians each have their own cell, in, the, in Basil of, of Caesarea's model, Macrina's model, they're more likely to live in, in like in dormitories. Of course, our word dormitory comes from the Latin uh, dormus to sleep, which of course, the dormitory is where monks sleep. It, it enters the, the language that way. So in Cappadocia, they're organized into communities where they really live in community. If you go south, you find that in Syria, there are all sorts of people that are, they're totally against community. There's something interesting about Syrian asceticism because it's so radical. Um, the Egyptian hermits, we're all in favor of suffering and deprivation, and they, they didn't eat, they didn't do all sorts of things. Um, but in Syria, they take it to a higher art form. And, and one of the, the, well, athletes, this is a word they use, they call these people athletes for God. One of the athletes for God is Simeon Stylites. Or, and uh, I don't know if anybody's on the broadcast who's, who's been to the, the, the four churches that surround the pillar of Simeon Stylites, outside of Aleppo, this, uh, you can see my cursor, that little thumb in the middle of the picture on the right-hand side is all that's left of this pillar. Mm -hmm. But they built the church, one for each bit of the compass surrounding it. Thousands of pilgrims came to, say, to see Simeon the Stylite. Now, Simeon was an artist, an, an athlete. He starts out, he tries various things. He's for a while buries himself in the garden up to his knees for like three years. Uh, he then proceeds to, that doesn't work so well. He then has himself walled into a building <clears throat> and people still come and bother him in there because they're, he's such a holy man. Eventually he solves his problem with how to get away from the crowd by moving to the top of a pillar. Now, you've all traveled, you've all been in a world where there are lots of old pillars standing around. Uh, you know, the Greeks and Romans left, left a lot of pillars. So he moves on top of a pillar. Crowds still come, but he at least is up there. And you, you will see on the left-hand side from this, this medal of St. Simeon the Stylite, he's sitting on top of the pillar. Now, the snake of temptation, of course, is trying to get to him. Um, but He's, he, it is a Greco-Roman sort of a pillar. He sits up there for 37 years. And because the crowds keep building, they keep increasing the size of the pillar. It's a very complicated description in his life about how they, they can actually boost up the size of the pillar. 
Um, so he gets about 30 feet off the ground and lives in this, on the top of the pillar. Now it's a fairly large pillar, so he has a little hut sort of a thing, apparently. Uh, he only comes out occasionally uh, so people can see him. But uh, the, he becomes a huge celebrity. He's such a celebrity that the emperor sends gifts, the emperor seeks his advice, and he works miracles all over the place. So people ask him for help, he gives them help. Why can he do this? What is it about sitting on the top of a pillar for 37 years that lets you do this? Well, he has so um, mortified himself. He's come very close to God, and he can act as a, as a courtier in God's court. He, can, he has God's ear. His mortifications are horrifying. Um, one of the, the things that he, he gets an infection in his leg, and for seven months it produces maggots. He does he let any you know he does he try and cure it? No, of course not, because this is sent by God as another one of the tests. So whether the, the demons are coming from Satan or if they're they're just an illness in him, everything is a test which must be born with faith and fortitude, and that's what gets him close to God that in constant prayer. Uh, some of you know Mark Twain's uh, Connecticut Yankee in the court of King Arthur, and there was a pillar saint in that who bowed in prayer all the time. So, of course, the Yankee attached a pulley to him so he could run a sewing machine. But it is that, that kind of world. And these people were not that unusual. There are a lot of copycat pillar saints that, that appear all across that region. So Assyrian monasticism can be very, very rigorous. Um, one of the things about pillar saints is they do it individually. If you were to try and join the communities, either Pacomius's community or Basil of Caesarea's community, they would check you out to see if you were a little crazy because there was that fear that people who wanted to hurt themselves would join these communities, and that's not what they're for. <clears throat> so by the fourth century, fourth, fifth century, you've got monastic communities that spread from Egypt, up the Mediterranean, um, appearing in modern Turkey and in Syria, of course, in Greece, but they're going to go on. So in the, the latter half of the fifth century, a group of, of nine Syrian monks moved to Ethiopia. Now, they're probably refugees. They're, they have a, they're caught up in one of the battles about the nature of the Trinity. Um, but they moved to Ethiopia and established monasteries in the highlands of Ethiopia that are still there. So Ethiopia, which becomes in the, in the right, of, it's the first, one of the first Christian countries on earth. But it, these monks who 100 years later make Ethiopia truly Christian. And if you've had the, the pleasure of traveling to Ethiopia, I know a few of you have been there with me. Um, it's still a very Christian place. It's one of the, I find it a fascinating place because you, there are still living this kind of Christianity this, uh, that is described by, by the Desert Fathers. There are still hermits in Ethiopia. So the monks spread across the Middle East and down the Red Sea. Um, they also, of course, go to, go to France as, as they would. John Cassian is a Frenchman. He moved to Egypt became a monk, learned how to do it, and then he returned to Marseille, Marseille, can't say it, Marseille, and founded two monasteries in the year 415. Now, he founded one for men, St. Victor, uh, and one for women. So they're, they're one for each variety, uh, but they all practice the sort of asceticism practiced by the Desert Fathers. But by now, the monks are getting very sophisticated. And John Cassian is one of the most sophisticated of the lot. He thought a long time about sin. And I always tell my students, if you want good psychology, you need to look at what these monks were thinking about the causes of human misbehavior. <clears throat> um, he writes a book called The Conferences. And The Conferences is still a book read in monasteries all over the world. Because it is all about what causes you to sin. Where does temptation come from? And you mostly, probably all of you have heard of the seven deadly sins. Cassian has eight on his list, but 
essentially their gluttony, lust, greed, anger, pride, vainglory, and dejection or depression. He says, how do you avoid these? Well, let's see, what, what are the causes? Well, first there's the body. And obviously lust and gluttony relate to the body. So we have to mortify the body. You have to cut the body off from those things that, that incite lust and gluttony. <clears throat> um, the rest, he says, in kind of Freudian terms before Freud, are caused by the ego, caused by the self, the desire to have choice. And so you've got too much desire to have too much choice, you're going to start committing sin. Uh, anger, well, anger happens when other people get ahead of you, right? You think it should be this way, and they for you, and you get angry. Pride, well, pride is just you putting yourself first. Vainglory is you putting yourself first for no particular reason. I have beautiful blue eyes. I didn't do anything to get beautiful blue eyes. I'm still proud of them. I have vainglory over my eyes. Uh, depression, you've given up on God. You're depressed because you, you, you don't accept that God loves you and take care of you. So the, he is saying this is why the monastic discipline works the way it works. Why you need poverty. Poverty removes choice. Remember Pacomius' rule, you can't own even a needle of your own? If you have anything, you get choice. Choice produces sin. Chastity. Of course, sexual lust is a big issue for all of these people, so you have to cut yourself off from all of those temptations. And you must obey. Of course, you must obey God, but in the monastic setting, you must obey the abbot or the abbess, because that also removes choice. So to be a good ascetic under these rules is to give up yourself, to give up choice, to practice total humility. Um, I recommend it highly. I haven't managed it myself, but I understand it's a good lifestyle. <clears throat> so Cassian brings it to the West. Benedict of Nursia uh, is another hermit following exactly the same rules, but he establishes himself south of Rome. And he lives in a cave, still there. You can go see his cave. He lives in the cave. And once again, his reputation as a holy man draws disciples. And so in the end, he builds a monastery at Monte Cassino. And the monastery at Monte Cassino becomes the mother house of the Benedictine order. And the Benedictine order is the great monastic order of Western Europe. <clears throat> but like Pacomius, uh, Benedict writes a rule for his monks. And he, maybe because he'd read some John Cassian, um, he moderates Pacomius's strictness. But, and so it's not quite as, as horrible, although he, he really slays everything else. You can have out, you can have this much bread, you can have this much wine, you get two suits of clothing a year. Um, this is when you pray, and this is when you work. You divide the day up into three chunks of eight hours, prayer, work, and sleep. And it's all about keeping your hands busy <clears throat> and your head busy. Your head is busy with prayer, your hands are busy with work or at labore, to pray and to work. That is what the job of the monk is in the Benedictine system. <clears throat> so still, still lots of Benedictine monks around um, anywhere the Western Christianity is gone. So I've been working with speaker and travel now since 2008, and I've led people to a lot of monasteries. Um, and I'll lead them to some more. Uh, because one of the interesting things about monasticism is it creates institutions which last. If, if we look at the oldest institutions that survive from the ancient world, we still have monasteries. Uh, people would argue, well, like the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church, of course, is kind of contemporary. Uh, with monasticism, but there are still monastic communities functioning in the same places, doing the same things that they have been doing since the fourth century. <clears throat> um, this is the White Monastery in Egypt. Uh, just recently, the paintings there have been restored with a project for Yale University. Um, Ethiopian monasticism, alive and well. And this is the great the, the cross of axum which is a 10th century uh cross being used for healing 
a great, uh, I know Mary Hughes is on this, but Mary took a fabulous picture. And I just love this picture. It kind of sums up the experience of, of visiting Ethiopian Christians. Um, and here's the monastic library in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of these places where they haven't got it all under glass. Uh, it's still a functioning world, and so if you want to see the monastic library, you can. But of course, they have great illuminated manuscripts. Also happy to sell you modern illuminated manuscripts. Egypt, Egyptian monk. Uh, this is an Armenian monastery. No longer functioning, of course, but it's an Armenian monastery in eastern Turkey. Eastern Turkey, as some of you know from experience, uh, is full of churches and monasteries. Many of them are no longer functioning because of the, <clears throat> the, the cleansing of, in the early 20th century, but um, monasticism is very important among the Armenian Christian community. Uh, this is from the monastery of Mar Jabril, uh, or St. Gabriel in eastern Turkey. It's right on the, the Turkish-Syrian border in what is unofficially called Kurdistan. Uh, beautifully restored monastery, still functioning. <clears throat> another one from the same monastery, and yet another. Uh, because Armenia is so Christian, it has lots of monasteries. It, the, well, Ehab and I were talking the other day. When you're in Armenia, Georgia, the, it all runs together. It begins to get confusing just which one you've been in, but they have some fabulous buildings. Um, this is the, the cave monastery in Armenia. Um, another Armenian setting. The stone crosses, the carved stone crosses. Georgia. Um, I can go on and on with that. I couldn't find a picture of, of some of the Syrian monasteries because I, I, I was using old technology in those days and so I didn't have them downloaded. Uh, but this, this in the, the Christian monastic institution is such an important one in both the, the Eastern Christian and Western Christian traditions. And so uh, we'll go right on visiting monasteries any place that, that, that we can find them. But I, I hope that this has given you a sense of what the monastic life is about. It's to find that, that communion with God that helps you defeat sin and assure everlasting life. As St. Anthony would say, life is very short. Eternity is very long. What price eternity? Self-denial. But self-denial doesn't last long. You, you, you then can go on to heaven with God. So give up this world in order to gain that world. So I guess uh, it's time to open up for some questions. Nihab, do you moderate this part? Uh, no, if, if there are any questions, as I mentioned before, they should probably be easier put on the chat room. I am not sure if there is any, I will look. Yeah, I have one question about what your thoughts are about St. Catherine's in the Sinai. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really, a, it's a Greek monastery that actually still belongs technically to Greece, but it's on Egyptian land. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what, what kind of thoughts uh, you would like. I mean, it's, it's one of the great monastic sites in the world. And I, 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 unfortunately, I haven't been there. I'd love to be. Um, but it's still very much a functioning monastery. And one of the things, as Ehab is pointing out, there are all these interesting tensions between all the different kinds of Christian groups. And, and orthodoxies often divide themselves along linguistic lines. And so you, it's go if you can. I will go as soon as I can. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely. Another question. What does the university... Uh, oh. <laughs> USU stand for? A Utah State University. Ah, Utah State University. Yeah, I, I was chair of the history department and founder of the religious studies program there for, for 41 years, and then I retired and I'm still teaching. So uh -huh. it's my, my lifetime institution. I see, I see. And another question about Mount Athos, mm -hmm. which is really, it's the, it's the, you know, the birth or the beginning of the story of from the Holy Mountain, which yeah. is, I think it's one of the most 
amazing books. Anybody who's interested in history should read to understand how this entire Byzantine, you know, civilization and how Christianity spread out and what kind of sometimes confusion and amalgamation of, of you know, I mean, uh, some ethnic different things that are all blended together and, and how they impacted each other. Yeah, Athos is a, is a fascinating place. It, it's actually a collection of monasteries, but Athos is a, is a dedicated monastic mountain, so to speak. Um, very hard to get to, uh, impossible to get to if you're a woman. And it is a community or a set of communities that, that represent actually within themselves several different kinds of monastic traditions. But it comes out of, of the whole Byzantine promotion of Christianity. Remember, one of the things that, that makes Christianity succeed is, is a good government that promotes it. And that is what you, Athos comes out of that, that the Byzantine state was, was so encouraging this uh, that they would allow the creation of these dedicated monastic sites. So an, another st uh, stupendous place, but it, it becomes the seed for Orthodox monasticism. So uh -huh. it, it spreads People pilgrimage to Athos, take the teachings of Athos and go elsewhere. Um, come to the Ukraine with us next year. Um, you'll see lots and lots of monasteries, but their roots are all going back to, to Athos. I see. Uh, one other thing. When did the monks start making wine? <laughs> because I, I, I must admit, I mean, you know, it's not really going well. It's not really matching the idea of, you know, trying to be so, you know, deprived of everything. This is actually, it enhances feelings and, and things rather than deprives you of them. Yeah, well, we have to remember that, that the making of wine is, is as natural and necessary as the making of bread for most people in the world. Um, you know, oil and wine are the, and and bread are the things that you have to have. So uh, the, the communities become self-sufficient. And if to be self-sufficient, you make your own wine. And it just doesn't occur to anybody before the modern world that, that you shouldn't have that. And so uh, we now think of them, and especially the, the, some of the monasteries of the West, uh, as, as expert brewers and distillers and things. But it just starts with self-sufficiency. Uh, you made your own, and you didn't necessarily make good stuff. You just made your own because it was culturally assumed that you had to have wine. So unless you're deeply ascetic, I mean, a hermit doesn't have wine, but if you're in a monastic community, you're very likely to have your own. Okay, okay. And then uh, anything about the desert mothers? Yes. We can talk about that for for, for some time. I mean, yeah, um, just... just to very maybe short statement about them would suffice yeah. for now. Yeah. Well, the, the desert mothers, of course, they're the desert fathers, they're the desert mothers. And in the, the era of St. Anthony, the, you don't really have to differentiate ascetics or ascetics because they're individual human beings who went off to live this kind of a lifestyle. But uh, that said, in, in, a, in a patriarchal world, in a patriarchal church, the desert mothers often don't get noticed as much. Um, we talked about St. Macrina, who doesn't get the credit, her brother gets a lot of the credit, but the, the Desert Mothers, there are women who are ascetics like this, and their, Benedicta Ward has written a great book called The Desert Mothers that, that really looks at the, essentially, the, the, the penitential aspect of female um, asceticism, because uh -huh. the, the ancient world and the Christian church don't see men and women in the same way. So the asceticism that is practiced may be sort of similar, but the kinds of sins that are, they assume are being dealt with are somewhat different. Um, so yes, there, there, there is a whole literature on the Desert Mothers. Unfortunately, of course, we don't have much literature from their pens. So the, but we do have the hagiographies, the stories that are told about them. And the fact that the stories are told about them tells us that their communities value these stories enough to preserve them. Okay, and one, one last question and then I'll put my closing remarks. So any uh, comments on the monasteries of Kadisha in Lebanon, the Kadisha Valley monasteries? I, I have not been there. So 
I think I better not say too much about that. <laughs> well, we, we'd better than do a trip that goes there. So Yes, I think we, I agree, so totally. That, that's an excuse for me now. <laughs> yeah. But you have this time, make sure you use the right passport when you're in Lebanon. I know, I know. I'm not going to repeat my 2010 fiasco. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, in closing, I really would like to thank Norman for this beautifully prepared and delightfully presented lecture, which gave me actually personally a lot of understanding into the historical development of, you know, the, the monastic movement in the Egypt and in the Near East, and it was very informative. And I'd like to remind you that Norman is taking a trip actually to Egypt in February of 2021. It's almost sold out. I think we may have a couple of spots. And then after that, we have another trip to Egypt in October 2021, which is going to be with lecturer Iman Abdul Fattah, who many of you have enjoyed her lecture on the development of Islamic Cairo. And it's going to visit a lot of the Islamic monuments of Cairo, as well as a lot of the Coptic areas and monasteries and ancient churches of Egypt as well. So uh, I would love to hear from you about the lecture today by email. And I wish you all a great Labor Day week next week. Remain safe, healthy. And in the next few months, we hope that the world is going to you know, become a better place for all of us. And so we can resume again the activity that we all love most, which is really traveling. So Norman, thank you again. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.